Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to Journal Club. Today, we will discuss about guided versus standard antiplatelet therapy. Presenter will be Giulio D'Agosta from Giovanni Paolo II Hospital in Ragusa, and the editor-in-chief of our intervention, Professor Davide Capodanno, will give us some insight as expert. Enjoy the discussion and looking forward for your comments. Thank you. So the topic of today is uh, the guided uh, versus standard antiplatelet therapy patients undergoing CI with this thematic review and meta-analysis just published two months ago on Lancet. So just a quick introduction. Uh, we all know that the APT is the gold standard for the prevention of the thrombotic complication in patients undergoing PCI. And we know that clopidogrel is the most commonly used way to have inhibitor. However, the pharmacodynamic effects of clopidogrel, of clopidogrel is quite unpredictable because of uh, uh, there is inter-individual variability and uh, uh, for this reason a considerable number of patients persist with the high on-treatment platelet reactivity as called as HPR. And HPR is uh, associated with in increased thrombotic risk, especially faint thrombosis. But what is the high on-treatment platelet re reactivity and why we have this uh, uh, situation? Uh, there are multiple mechanisms, but uh, among these, uh, uh, the most important role is a genetic polymorphism of an hepatic cytochrome that is required to uh, transform the clopidogrel into the, its uh, active metabolite. So a loss of function of this gene reduces the active metabolite generation that increases the HPR rates and enhances the thrombotic risk. Instead, Prasuril and Ticaglor have a more potent and predictable pharmacodynamics, and for this reason, uh, HPR is uncommon with these antiplatelet therapies. So, the, but what means the guided antiplatelet therapy is the, the aim is to tailor the antiplatelet therapies in order to reduce the thrombotic events, and I also say the bleeding events, on, on the basis of the results of platelet function test or genotype test. Uh, similar to the Heine R uh, to detect the levels and the efficacy of oral anticoagulation, uh, with the uh, guided antiplatelet therapy, we have to struggle in, or in order to um, uh, obtain a value that lies between the two extremities of the platelet reactivity, between the low platelet reactivity, LPR, and the high platelet reactivity and this might develop the lowest risk for adverse events. As we can appreciate in this uh, figure uh, of uh, the consensus document uh, of American College, uh, we can see that uh, there are many factors that can impact on the platelet activity. Some of these are modifiable factors like diabetes, smoking and obesity, and uh, some of these are not modifiable, uh, like genetics, agents, X. And when we see to the two extremities of the platelet reactivity, we can see that uh, in case of uh, LPR with the low platelet reactivity, there are concerns about the bleeding risk. So we can guide the therapy of platelet uh, in making a de-escalation strategy. So switching from more potent platelet therapy to, uh, I don't know, clopidogrel. And on the contrary, when we are in front of an HPR patient where there are concerns about the high ischemic risk, we can de -escalate, uh, escalate, sorry, the strategy, uh, reaching from clopidogrel to another potent PQY12 inhibitor like Ticaglor or Parasugrel. And uh, in this way, we can uh, search to, uh, to obtain the therapeutic window. But what are the evidence before this study? Uh, there are a lot of data, a lot of trials that were published in the last two decades, and early randomized trials did not find any benefit of guided therapy, and the uh, last trials have not provided unequivocal results. Uh, because of pitfalls in trial design, such as an inclusion of low-risk patients in adequate therapy, and the infrequent use of P2Y12 inhibitors, uh, in in fact, many of these uh, studies enrolled patients with the escalation strategy that consists in the adding the uh, chilostazole or a double dose clopidogrel in the escalation strategy. And uh, the main reason is also the lack of power for our efficacy outcome in these trials. 
So for this reason, the, uh, there, are, um, there is a, a small room in the recommendations. In fact, the uh, guidelines, uh, uh, European guidelines, say that the, the escalation strategy uh, with a guided antiplatelet <laughs> therapy uh, may be considered only in, uh, especially for ACS patients that presented with uh, unsuitable for 12-month uh, potent platelet inhibition. And in the American consensus document, uh, they say that the results of these tests should never be used alone, but must be integrated with numerous other clinical and geographical procedural uh, variables that together should be uh, uh, guide the DAPT. But uh, uh, coming back to our paper, um, the authors uh, uh, make this meta-analysis uh, in order to overcome the limitation of published trials and included RCT studies and observational studies uh, comparing the antiplatelet therapy versus the standard uh, DAPT in patients with acute and chronic coronary syndrome that underwent to PCI with the stent implantation. And the guided therapy included the strategy of either escalation and de-escalation strategy. And um, the primary outcome of uh, this, this meta-analysis were uh, MACE and any bleeding. And instead, uh, secondary endpoints were all-cause death, cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, stent thrombosis, and minor and major bleeding. This is the study selection. More than 3,000 uh, of the trials were screened, and only um, 11 uh, RCT studies and three observational studies were included. The others were excluded because not a relevant disease condition uh, with uh, low risk patients, not pertinent antithrombotic regimen, or a period uh, of uh, follow up shorter than six months. This is the table with the included uh, and enrolled uh, trials. We can see uh, that the, these trials ranged from uh, data of publication from the 2012 uh, to 2020. And uh, we can see the uh, study population with the STEMI and STEMI and stable angina patients and the CCS. The, the type of tests used to guide the platelet therapy and the rates of the uh, drugs used to make the de-escalation or escalation strategy. This is the continuous of the previous slide, and we can see that the average proportion of patients treated with the drug lutestand uh, range from 18% uh, from this study to the 18 uh, to 100% from uh, of other studies. Uh, mm, about the data analysis, uh, all analysis were done according to the principle pre-specified subgroup analysis and uh, uh, random uh, control of RCT uh, studies versus observational studies in order to assess the weight of non-RCT studies uh, on the analysis. And uh, two further subgroups analysis were run according to the type of test used, so platelet function testing or genetic testing, and the type of strategy, the escalation versus escalation. Um, moreover, to explore the whether a single study significantly impact on the robustness of the findings, uh, the authors performed a sensitivity analysis by sequentially removing each single study from the uh, overall effect estimates. It was performed a further sensitivity analysis for all the included outcome by excluding studies that used the addition of chilostazole and double dose clopidogrel in the guided therapy in order to assess the use of more potent P2Y12 inhibitors. Sorry, this is the results. Uh, 14 studies were enrolled with a total of uh, more than uh, 20,000 patients and a mean follow-up of 11 months. Uh, within each trial, uh, baseline characteristics were bi uh, similar between guided and standard groups, and uh, there were no differences between subgroups according to the type of test used. So uh, platelet function test is similar to genetic testing. And uh, uh, talking about the primary outcome, we can see uh, from this table that uh, um, the guided therapy is uh, uh, improving the uh, MACE uh, significantly. And we can see that the p-value is 0 0.015. And 
in uh, the corporate the co-primary endpoint of any bleeding is also reduced but not reach the statistical significance but when we see the other secondary outcome like cardiovascular death myocardial infarction stent thrombosis and stroke we can see that uh, also, uh, all of this uh, secondary outcome uh, favors guided therapy. So mm, I think that uh, this is a stunning result. And uh, why, uh, when we can, uh, we, when we um, make a distinction uh, between the guided selection strategy, uh, such as the, uh, the escalation strategy and the escalation strategy, we can appreciate that in the escalation strategy, all the ischemic outcomes like MACE, uh, cardiovascular death, MI, stent thrombosis, and stroke are significantly reduced with guided therapy uh, without any trade-off in bleeding. And uh, uh, on the contrary, uh, when we evaluate the de-escalation strategy, we can see that we have a, a reduction, significant reduction in bleeding driven by the minor bleeding and not by the uh, major bleeding without any trade-off in ischemic events. So in uh, conclusion, uh, on patients undergoing PCI, uh, the guide selection with, uh, of the oral antiplatelet therapy uh, by means of the flat platelet function test or genetic test significantly improve both the composite and hard outcome in uh, um, ischemic outcome and the, the um, bleeding outcome driven by a significant reduction of minor bleeding, but no difference in major bleeding. Efficacy and safety outcome varied according to the strategy used with a de-escalation approach that is uh, more effective in reducing ble bleeding, obviously, and uh, the uh, escalation strategy that is more effective in, in reducing ischemic events without an increase in bleeding. So I think that this observation provides support uh, for the use of uh, this uh, test as tools to guide the selection of uh, antibiotic therapy in uh, patients undergoing PCI. Thank you for the attention. Okay, uh, thank you Guido for that nice overview of, of this paper. Um, Professor Capitano, can I invite you in to share with us, let's say your overview messages from this paper and uh, essentially, um, let's say some key take home messages, practical messages as well for us, please. Okay, with pleasure. Well, first of all, congratulations, uh, Guido, because you have uh, really summarized uh, nicely the rationale for the meta-analysis and also the methodology and, uh, and results. Well, let's say there are two uh, perspectives here. Uh, one is the methodological perspective, of course, uh, so talking about meta-analysis because we are in a journal club uh, format, and the other is the practical uh, one, as uh, has been said. So in terms of uh, methodology, of course, meta-analysis, or you like them or you hate them. Uh, so uh, obviously, um, uh, my perspective is that is the one of uh, one who likes them a lot, and I feel that sometimes when I hear about criticism of meta-analysis, this comes from people that never tried uh, the the beautiful exercise of doing a meta-analysis. The problem with meta-analysis interpretation is that uh, when you are too puristic and you start uh, uh, struggling with the type of studies and points outcomes that were put together, of course you will. Uh, never be satisfied because you will always see a difference in this trial versus this trial. And you will say, okay, this is uh, mixing uh, apples and oranges as uh, typically uh, people say. However, the perspective changes when you realize that uh, it's not a mix of uh, apples and oranges. It's just viewing at fruits. So this is what uh, meta-analysis uh, do very nicely, basically put together some signals from different studies that were not powered for looking at specific endpoints magnify that signal in order to generate an hypothesis that uh, uh, must be, of course, uh, plausible and, uh, of course, reflected in other studies, etc. So what this meta-analysis in my uh, mind did nicely was to uh, see the forest more than the trees, as it's uh, commonly uh, said. So the fact that uh, guiding antiplatelet therapy selection uh, is better than just giving the same uh, dose and uh, drug to all people. So uh, practically speaking, uh, this is a meta-analysis uh, of guided therapies, not just de-escalation or escalation as Guido has mentioned, meaning that uh, uh, we are talking of the concept of modulating 
dual antiplatelet therapy essentially. So I, I like the principle of uh, uh, therapeutic window. Uh, we do that with uh, hypertensive agents. We do that uh, with any kind of drugs in uh, medicine. I don't uh, see the reason why we cannot do that with antithrombotics, by the way. And uh, the meta-analysis essentially uh, includes patients with uh, chronic coronary syndromes who are candidates for escalation. Of course, they do clopidogrel by default and can, they can do something more. In this uh, set of studies, of course, we have the problem in the meta-analysis that uh, some of them uh, were with uh, siloxazole, so uh, tripole antiplatelet therapy. Others were uh, old studies with uh, double dose clopidogrel. So obviously this is not the standard of care, but it's something more than just clopidogrel. So this is the, the concept I was mentioning. Uh, so in these patients, you try to do something more. You can escalate to parasugel and uh, ticagolob. This is something that guidance, by the way, allow. It's a 2B indication for complex PCI because we are, uh, of course, in the GISA uh, seminar. So it's something we already do with the level of evidence C in a way. Now, sometimes you have so many stents, you have a left main involved, etc. You want to do something more than just uh, uh, clopidogrel. So the concept is alive and well already in our practice. The other part of the meta-analysis is de-escalation. Here, I would say that the trials are more specific, so it's easier to find some uh, uh, benefit, uh, some hint of benefit in this part of the analysis. And of course, here the benefit is uh, reducing bleeding. So the escalated from prasugel, take agro to clopidogrel. Something I want to mention because the, the question was about practice is that uh, all this uh, uh, guided therapy is not easy to implement. So uh, what the meta-analysis uh, does probably is to show that there is a, a high potential if uh, uh, this testing will become easier. But remember that for the uh, phenotype part, so the de-escalation essentially, you must be on the drug where you want to assess the high platelet reactivity. So in tropical ACS, for example, patients were switched back from prasugel to clopidogrel. Then they did the test. If the test was positive for HPR, they were switched back to prasugel. Otherwise, they continue to clopidogrel. Obviously, this is not easy to implement in practice. But the proof of concept is there. And for the uh, genetic part of the story, now there is uh, rapid testing, not available in my center. I don't know about uh, yours, but uh, it's a buccal swab. So basically in 30 minutes, you can know the genotype of the patient and move accordingly. This is quite easy, but of course it's not widely available. So in, in summary, I would say that the meta-analysis, um, I know, uh, Lancet accepted it, but of course it could have been even uh, the opposite, no? So it depends on whether uh, the reviewers, the editors uh, want to embrace the message. Here, I think the success of this uh, meta-analysis, and I think uh, uh, I have to credit really Mattia Galli, who is uh, a young interventionist uh, uh, like you, and uh, so it's a, a good example, um, who is working with Dominic Angiolillo now. Um, I think uh, the meta-analysis uh, uh, hit the sweet spot here of uh, uh, statistical significance, but also clinical plausibility. When you have both things, uh, probably uh, the chances for success for a meta-analysis are higher, otherwise it's much more difficult. Uh, however, I think that uh, the idea of uh, tailoring and uh, personalizing uh, DAPT is uh, here to stay. Okay, thank you. That's a really nice uh, summary. Are there any questions from anybody else regarding this paper or regarding this topic? Good, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Julia Maziero. I would like uh, to ask to Guido and uh, to Professor Capodanno, uh, what about uh, the, the timing of this test when uh, execute them um, in the acute phase? I believe, and uh, if uh, um, there is also a role, uh, a remaining role of, of the duration of the APT that uh, otherwise this meta-analysis do, um, do not embrace. Um, Julia, I answer. Um, there are two main, um, uh, I, I don't know how to say, uh, there are two main uh, reasons to, if we are in front of genotype testing, we can do this before the PCI because genotype not, doesn't change. Uh, instead, we, if we make the uh, platelet function test, we, we will make it, uh, of course, uh, post PCI. And in the uh, trials enrolled in this meta analysis, uh, there are some differences in uh, the time of um, test. Uh, the early trials make the test in the morning later than um, PCI, 
or uh, 24 or uh, 48 hour post PCI. Uh, instead, the, uh, the um, late trials make this the uh, two weeks uh, last, uh, after the PCI and remake this uh, six months later in order to understand if the, uh, there is a change in the platelet uh, reactivity. So this is the, um, the answer. Okay, I take the other question on the duration of the APT after this answer from Guido on the first point. Uh, first of all, Julia, congratulations for what you are the, uh, doing uh, with the GZ Young eh? and uh, to all of you, because I'm very, very impressed from uh, this participation at this time of the, of the morning. Congratulations, really. Uh, so, sh um, shortening the APT uh, further means that, uh, so we have uh, six months of uh, dual antipathy therapy for CCS now and 12 months for ACS. So, shortening further means uh, three months or one month in CCS, which is uh, uh, allowed by the guidance in this moment and uh, six, three months in uh, ACS, which is doable. It's very difficult to uh, run trials that show that because of course the event rates are becoming uh, um, less and less. But uh, I think the next uh, um, big stop uh, in uh, this topic will be master DAPT uh, because this is a trial uh, entirely in patients at HPR. It's expected to be presented at the ESC uh, this year, hopefully. And uh, this is really different from other trials that we have seen uh, on the topic that compares the stents. So this is a uh, um, trial that compares strategies. And uh, essentially what you are mentioning, shorter versus longer in the context of a current standard of care. So I think uh, this is a quite unique design in order to know what is the trade-off uh, between the bleeding and ischemia in these patients. Because of course, we uh, agree that the shortening the APT is better to reduce bleeding, but if you have a rebound in ischemic and thrombotic events, which are very high in these patients as well, of course, uh, uh, this is uh, problematic. Uh, so I think there is uh, still space for uh, uh, looking uh, data in this domain. Thank you very much. And what about uh, the role of different devices uses uh, in, the included, in, the, in the included studies in the meta-analysis, uh, first generation, the generation, second generation, uh, that's BMS. This is a very good point. Uh, so the, uh, we try to address this issue. Of course, uh, we included studies that, that range uh, and span uh, over a decade. Uh, the way in a meta-analysis you can try to address this is to run a meta-regression where you uh, pull uh, and you plot essentially the treatment effect of the meta-analysis versus the year of the study. So the meta-regression in this case was uh, not significant, uh, which is uh, somehow reassuring that uh, there is no effect of uh, temporal bias. Okay, any other questions that anybody wants to ask or if it's easier, then please feel free to type it in the chat and we can address them that way. We have about five minutes left. So uh, any last questions or comments? Um, if there's no question- One question to Professor uh, Capodanno. Um, I'm wondering if this data, these restanding results will change our clinical practice and guidelines or we need more evidence to do this. Uh, thank you, Guido. So uh, I think before changing practice, uh, uh, this data, if anything, should try at least to convince uh, the task force of guidelines, because uh, then uh, it's easier, of course. If the guidelines change, then the practice will adapt uh, slowly, because there is obviously some uh, clinical inertia. Here, there is also the use of devices, uh, and uh, it needs expertise to run this test. So I would predict that, that this will not change practice in many, many years. But uh, I think in this moment, there is a to be recommendation for uh, guided therapy in uh, the ACS guidelines. I suppose that the CCS guidance will do the same. Probably what uh, should change, uh, if not the recommendation, is the level of evidence, because uh, uh, it can be uh, A with a meta-analysis. Uh, and if the task force will be brave enough, this could become even a QA, because there is evidence on uh, cardiovascular death, the stent thrombosis, MI, so a range of very hard outcomes. We will see. I have another question. Uh, does uh, uh, the patient on oral antiplatelet uh, um, uh, or on ARC were excluded from the analysis? And if so, do you believe that uh, this uh, test uh, could be helpful uh, in this patient that cannot uh, um, 
that maybe they have to use clopidogrel instead of um, a more potent uh, P2, 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 what do you think about? We don't. So the, um, there are uh, very small data about the, this topic in uh, uh, mixing the oral anticoagulation uh, platelet uh, uh, therapy. So there are no support to, to, to do this uh, uh, at the moment, but uh, maybe in, uh, in the next future can, uh, can be. Yeah, like we, so the proportion of patients on OAC in uh, this study says very minimal and modest at best. The good news is that this uh, uh, test, uh, um, basically, even in patients on OAC, uh, give you an information about antiplatelet therapy. So, of course, uh, it's not confirmed by this meta-analysis, but it makes sense uh, that if you know uh, about uh, the platelet reactivity in these patients, uh, you can uh, decide accordingly. Obviously, in a patient who is anticoagulated, you would go for clopidogrel as, uh, as a first choice. So, of course, uh, the option of escalation is not, uh, of course, an option, while the escalation makes a lot of sense. Okay, um, one question, what are the cost implications and what are the differences between plated reactivity and genetic testing? I mean, if we, if we want to, let's say, include this in more and more centers, institutions and in our practice, um, is there a big cost implication associated with this? So let's say that the platelet function test is not very costly. So each uh, cartridge of Verify Now basically is uh, quite cheap. Of course, you have to uh, buy the console, but uh, the idea is that you spend some money in order to uh, prevent spending more money because of the complication, et cetera. So cost analysis are uh, necessary in order to confirm that because the cost efficacy is now uh, the, the end point of our days. Uh, in terms of genetics, I don't know the exact price. Uh, obviously, the uh, pricing of of the buccal swab is much less as compared with the traditional uh, test. But of course, the cost analysis are needed. Okay, thank you. So last couple of minutes, any further questions from anybody else? Um, just a curiosity, um, which type of test do you believe or think could be useful or more practical? Uh, I think the most practical is uh, genetics because uh, essentially you can run your primary PCI while the testing is running. And at the end of the primary PCI, you have the result, you already take an action. You don't need the patient to come back to the hospital at two weeks in order to do the platelet function test. So no doubt about this. I just want to mention that we also uh, proved uh, as a concept the idea that uh, enhancing the benefit of knowing the genetic uh, result with the clinical variables such as age, diabetes, et cetera, improve the discrimination of this uh, test for uh, outcomes uh, which are beyond the HPR. It's also maize, uh, et cetera, and mortality. So this is a very active field of research, I believe. So in the future, we, we can hope that we'll have uh, some tests that during the PCI will merge the mm, genotypic information, the clinical information from uh, ARC-HBR, and then the exams information, the complexity of our PCI, and then uh, should tell us uh, which is the more uh, correct uh, DAPT for our patient. It's very exciting. I really hope so because we are in the era of uh, evidence-based medicine and we are moving towards uh, personalized medicine. So this is futuristic, of course, but uh, foreseeable future. Great. And I think final comments then, um, as we're talking about the future, Prof, I just want to ask you academically, what do you see is the next step that this field has to go towards? What are the next, let's say, type of studies or or sorts of studies, because there's been lots of randomized trials, we've got different settings, different scenarios, different tests. What do you think in the next, is coming up in the next, let's say, three to five years to really advance this field forward? Well, let's say some years ago, uh, many industries put together uh, efforts and money in order to run the DAPT trial. Uh, that was 10,000 patients. So you need those kind of numbers to address both uh, uh, ischemic and bleeding endpoints. So in my uh, mind, what is needed now is a very large uh, collaborative trial 
that put together 10,000 patients and address the uh, safety of uh, um, therapies in uh, patients with HPR. When I say safety, I mean no rebound in thrombotic events because efficacy is, of course, reducing bleeding in this case specifically. So a trial that is powered for both ischemic and bleeding endpoints showing the benefit or the harm of shortening the APT versus uh, uh, longer term. And maybe another one, would be really to test head to head the strategies, the escalation versus the genotype uh, guided approach. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So uh, we've just come to eight o'clock. So if there's any last questions or comments, then if not, then uh, it just leaves me to first of all say thank you very much, uh, Guido, for your great presentation and a really stimulating discussion. Professor Capadano, it's a real pleasure on behalf of all of us fellows who've joined, Jesus Young and everybody here. Uh, thank you so much for joining us so early, your comments, and we really appreciate both the, the statistical side of things to really understand a little bit more about the methodologies and how these papers are put together, and then also the field uh, and where we're going. And I hope today's discussion has stimulated some people to further advance this field, do some more research. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Ciao. Right. Ciao, ciao. Thank See you, you everybody next week. Next Friday, Journal Club continues and we'll be in touch shortly. Thank you.